Selamat pagi, selamat datang. Mr. Michael Walsh, the Chief Executive Officer of Pacific Basin Economic Council, PBAC, who is online with us from Hong Kong. Mr. Chu Yingpu, publisher and editor-in-chief of the China Daily. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you to the 2023 Asia Economic and Entrepreneurship Summit. At the outset, I would like to thank PBAC, the Pacific Basin Economic Council, and China Daily Asia Pacific for co-organizing today's seminar with us. It's a great honor for us to bring together government business and thought leaders to share their ideas, their knowledge, and their perspectives with all of us at today's summit. We meet here amidst a more VUCA world environment, more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uncertainty is something that will prevail in the world for a long time to come, in my opinion. In the new global economic and geostrategic order, we will see an increasing pivot to multilateralism. And it is in multilateral collaboration that we hope we can build a better, safer, and more sustainable world. Increasingly, we will see a greater shift towards what some has described as the CIA, China, India, and ASEAN. And I think this is a very strategic change to have a greater collaboration and partnership between China, India, and ASEAN. One key consideration that we need to deliberate upon is are we in a middle income trap? Or do we see middle income opportunities? The question is, how can countries respond to this middle income dilemma? China, India, and ASEAN are all aspiring to become middle income countries. Attaining middle income open up huge opportunities, but it is not an easy journey, but a journey that we must embark upon. We hope that here in Malaysia, we can position Malaysia to be the fulcrum of the CIA, of China, India, and ASEAN, and to take advantage of the opportunities that will arise from collaboration with China, India, and ASEAN. Going forward, we need to also increasingly take into account green and digital technologies and transformation. For we see the growth of digital and green technology as future trade drivers. Trade and investment and infrastructure development will boost the economies of our region. One challenge that we need to address is to further accelerate the implementation of RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic and Partnership Agreement. And for us who are part of CPTPP, the implementation of CPTPP will open up a lot more opportunities for our countries. Going forward, we need to have strong, effective, dynamic, and visionary leadership, both at governmental and business levels. We need transformational leadership to lead organizational change in companies and enterprises. 
and hence in today's second session, we will focus on this important topic of entrepreneurial and business leadership and lessons to be learned. Lastly, formulation businesses. Let us recall the recent statement made by our Minister for Investment, Trade and Industry, Tunku Dato Sri Safrol, who have exalted that Malaysian companies must go big or go home. I think this is some food for thought for all of us. I'd like to end by thanking our many distinguished speakers who have come together to address us. I would also like to congratulate our many award recipients who will be receiving special awards during lunch. So again, terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you, Tan Sri, for your welcome speech, highlighting our regional challenges in a VUCA environment, which calls for greater multilateral cooperation with FTAs like RCEP, CPTPP, in ushering a more sustainable and prosperous, prosperous world. Next, please put your hands together for Mr. Chi Ying Pu, publisher and editor in chief of the China Daily Group, who will be delivering his welcome speech. Good morning, respected guests, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of China Daily, I extend a warm welcome to this platform that invites government officials, business leaders, and thought leaders to share and exchange strategic views and challenges across Asia. As we face challenges such as inflation, food security, the energy crisis, pollution and environmental degradation, rising pressure on global supply chains and geopolitical competition, we recognize that individual and collective limits are being tested. At the same time, the rate of technology is accelerating faster than ever. In this era of uncertainty, Asia needs to adapt, embrace change, and strive for an economically prosperous an environmentally responsible future. Today, we gather under the theme, Powering Future, Proofing Asia, to promote closer collaboration and partnership between government and business, and to accelerate sustainability and economic resilience in Asia. According to McKinsey Research, Asia is on track to top 50% of global GDP by 2040, and drives 40% of the world's consumption. As the world's largest regional economy and farthest growing economic region, Asia is shaping the global scale. However, as with any development, there are always obstacles. Growing in sustainable and green ways has gained global attention. The panel discussion on the Green Reset Future Ready Asia aims to drive positive change and forge a future where digital, green, and innovation-led growth become the norm. However, the path is not without challenges, which is why entrepreneurs and business leaders must play a transformative role. The second panel discussion, Entrepreneurial and Business Leadership for a New Era, will explore what factors and efforts entrepreneurs must commit to in order to move toward a more sustainable future. As Asia continues to change and reshape, we must adapt, collaborate, and embrace. President Xi Jinping has said that the biggest strength comes from cooperation, and the most effective way is through solidarity. We at China Daily stand together with all of you in our common vision for prosperous, sustainable, and future-proof Asia. We believe that we can pave the way for Asia's bright future, one that thrives amidst a diversity and serves as a catalyst for global progress. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for being part of the sixth Asia Economic and Entrepreneurship Summit. I hope you enjoy it and take away something useful. Thank you so much. 
We thank Mr. Chi for his welcome speech talking about economic challenges, food security and environmental challenges which require greater collaboration between governments and businesses, which requires us to adapt and to have solidarity, allowing Asia to thrive. Next, please welcome our partner from the Pacific Basin Economic Council, also known as PBAC, with its Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Michael Walsh, who will be delivering his welcome speech online. Good morning, distinguished guests, government officials, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to be able to join you virtually on behalf of our Chairman, Andrew Weir, who sends his apologies and best wishes to provide some brief comments and wish to thank, first of all, the organizers, Tantri Michael Yao and his wonderful team for putting us all together. Today's theme, Powering and Future Proof Asia, will cover different topics, including digitalization and green growth. But I wanted to give somewhat of a regional overview first, given PBEC's role as a super connector in cross-border relations and intelligence. So without further ado, what is it that PBEC is seeing at the moment? given we're at past the halfway stage in 2023. There's definitely no shortage of capital. There's plenty of capital sitting on balance sheets and in funds, sovereign wealth or mega funds like BlackRock and even within the family offices as well as corporations. But the global dry powder uh, is probably the largest, in its mem uh, the largest it's been in memory. You've got a lot of previously invested capital by PE seeking exits and the exit route for IPOs is very favorable and valuations are very unfavorable to be fair at the moment and uncertainty due to rising interest rates. Trade deals between funds and investors have really slowed down also. So what has happened to what we regarded in the last 15 years as globalization? We're seeing that it's becoming more regionalization based. The unfettered globalization trend of the last uh, decade or so for all of us who love trade and international uh, business due to the failure of some national policies given rise to a different type of globalization. Supply chains, as we've seen, have shifted to just in time to adjust in case as well, which basically means having sufficient cushions and buffers in the supply chains uh, enough to have alternatives when and we're seeing onshoring is continuing in major economies. One of the outcomes of COVID is national security. In terms of national security, three major themes are now on focus, or say, I should say three major regions are now in focus, US, Europe, and APAC, including LATAM and the Pacific Basin. The trends being observed in APAC are things like the foreign businesses, China plus one strategies that we've seen, but Chinese companies themselves are doing a lot more onshore but when they go outbound, they, they themselves are using the China plus one model as well. The biggest beneficiaries in ASEAN economies that we already know about have been economies like Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand. But Malaysia also is well positioned, as Michael has indicated. Geopolitical influence, for instance, there's major capital flows are now intra-regional. The capital is remaining more in APAC and more by bilateral agreements. So the money is doing more within the region. The other trend is the Middle East being now called or dubbed West Asia, historically being in a bit of a gap between Europe and Asia. Seismic shifts um, looking eastwards, natural synergies such as 25% of China's trade flows through UAE and some of the denomination being uh, uh, qualified as in RMB when it comes to trade uh, settlements. So is this a window of time or a structural shift? We're not sure at PBEC, but it's more than a trickle, but not yet a flood. But we do advise to get your relationships in and challenge and challenge your linkages in order. UAE and the Middle East is relationship orientated and it requires agility to adjust accordingly. Money is being repatriated to Asian economies. Whilst economic activity overall is subdued, banks are doing well with interest rates being higher, but business leaders take, are taking less risks and are staying in liquid ter territory at the moment. The debt figures for some Western economies is concerning. How can non-aligned economies participate in settling in other non-US currencies? Are we seeing the rise of other currencies, for instance? 
We've also heard the phrase moving from decoupling now to de-risking. De-risking doesn't mean withdrawing or exiting from markets like China. However, in China, the economic activity has seriously dropped in Q2, in, and in particular in service sectors, as the government hasn't given any further indication of further stimulus measures at the moment. The Pacific Basin remains the best demographic and long-term economic wealth creation story globally that some people tend to forget. This means that economies like Malaysia are well positioned to take full advantage of the next wave of technological advancements to compete with others within ASEAN, but more in interestingly, work together in common areas as a block to compete with other major regions to win out on new business opportunities in trade, services and manufacturing. So where is the new future? As Michael mentioned, the CIA and PBEC wholeheartedly agree. China flows into ASEAN and the Middle East, and of course, the rise of India's economy uh, give way to lots of opportunities for surrounding economies such as Bangladesh, Pakistan and parts of Africa and Eastern Europe are, are benefiting, as well as, of course, ASEAN. Singapore's value proposition is also very strong and has increased during COVID. Malaysia can tap the investment flows of some of the regional headquarters set up in Singapore over the past year, three years due to Singapore's rising cost of living and lack of space. Malaysia, especially Johar Bahru, are attracting more Singaporean hybrid and skilled workers, encouraging them to commute when needed. But let's not forget, Malaysia is also a highly regarded tourist destination and can perhaps be doing more to remind fellow Asians of, it, of this gem within the ASEAN region that is within easy reach by three or four hour flights. Now, coming back to Hong Kong, where I'm based, uh, it's, it's still very much an international finance center, the largest in Asia in terms of capital flows. The offshore internationalization of the renminbi and the connect schemes to other financial centers is of a great advantage to near, to near close economies like Malaysia. The one country, two systems still can reap more benefits and future facilitate IPOs. When we talk about China outbound, we're talking really about the GBA, Greater Bay Area, which is in southern China, and the growth that that can bring. It will also bring further wealth and opportunities for economies like Malaysia. But let's not forget, as business leaders, there is a bit of COVID fatigue, which is causing problems within people and companies as they've all been through the mill. Having the agility and flexibility to change course they're in particular looking at cost base and understanding what their clients really want now requires these entrepreneurs and leadership that are going to be talking today. It's never been more important to hear what they, their ideas are and where they can take us. I started my talk about capital and I could also touch upon the ESG, inclusion, diversity, AI, digital transformation, equity, etc. But a lot of these topics will be covered later in the uh, summit, and they all come under the umbrella of good corporate governance, which I typically like to finish on at a PBEC, where we are pushing this subject pretty hard these days. So what's in your firm's purpose? What are you doing about it? Well, to finish with APEC USA coming up in November, Asia's voice generally in global trade institution isn't where it could be. The allocation of international capital to Asia Pacific is less than the relatively economic weighting it warrants. And I think it is so important through PBEC and KSI to raise our voices on this. We are the voices, after all, of trade and cross-border international relations to influence policy, influence regulations, which are super important for the future of the region. So I'll leave it there and hand you back to our host for today. Thank you once again to Michael Yao and his wonderful team for inviting us to share my thoughts with you. And I wish you a wonderful, successful event.